you've ever heard of quantum computing, you've probably been told that it somehow speeds things up by exponentially parallelizing computation or something. But this explanation is badly misleading. So let's try to correct it. We'll start with a normal classical bit, which can be in one of two states, 0 or 1. Three such bits can represent 2 times 2 times 2, or eight possible values. For shorthand, we will write those values in base 10. A classical 3-bit variable, or register, will contain only one of those values. For example, it might contain 5. Three quantum bits, or qubits, will contain a superposition of all eight possibilities at the same time. We represent this as a vector with eight entries, which correspond to the eight possible results. In quantum mechanics, when you observe the value of a variable, it collapses into just one of the possible results. For example, we might get back value 3. Which value we get is random, and the probability of getting any one result is given by the square of the corresponding entry. For example, the probability of getting result 3 is given by d squared. If we have this vector, then the probability of results 1, 3, 5, and 7 are each 25%. In general, these entries can be complex numbers, but for simplicity, here we will stick with real numbers. Negative numbers are also allowed. Notice that squaring a negative number still gives a positive probability. Because the squares give probabilities, they must sum to 1. And recall from the Pythagorean theorem that the sum of the squares of the entries gives you the length squared of the whole vector. Together, this means that the vector must have length 1. We will see the importance of this later. There's another way we can visualize vectors which may seem a little strange at first. We can plot them on a line chart. Notice how this looks like a pixelated sine wave. The more qubits we have, the closer our approximation can get. But let's stick to 3 for now. You've probably heard of the wave-particle duality in quantum physics. Well, this is such a wave. When you observe its value, it collapses to one result. This is analogous to finding a localized particle. Waves can also interfere. To see how that happens, let's go back to our vector component representation. This time we will write our vector in column form. We can multiply this on the left by an 8 by 8 matrix M. The result will be a new 8 component vector W. A remarkable fact about our universe is that all physical laws are ultimately expressed at the quantum level as rotation matrices, or really their complex equivalents called unitary matrices. That deserves its own video. For now, just notice that rotating a vector doesn't change its length. That's important, because the length must remain 1 so that the probabilities still add to 1. Now, linear algebra tells us that we can break this product down into the sum of 8 products, and this operation is implemented efficiently by quantum mechanics. So it's kind of like we're doing 8 computations at the same time. If we had 4 qubits, that would be like parallelizing 2 to the 4 or 16 computations. With 5, that's 32, and so on. This is why people say that quantum computers work through exponential parallelism. With just 100 qubits, that value is around 10 to the 30, but this is badly misleading. First, we can only parallelize a very specific kind of multiplication. More importantly, when you try to read the result, you only get one of the values. What good is parallelism if you have to throw away almost all of the results? So, exponential parallelism is a terrible explanation. There's something much more interesting going on. Suppose that m times this input vector gives us some result, which we can view as a wave. Similarly, multiplying by this vector gives us a different wave. If we multiply by the sum of those two vectors, the result will be the sum of the two waves. The waves will add, like so. Let's rewind and look at the two waves individually. Notice how in some places, the red and green waves will cancel each other out, like at positions 1 and 5. In other places, they will amplify each other, like at positions 3 and 7. 
This is constructive and destructive wave interference, like in the famous two-slit experiment. It only works because values are allowed to be negative. And that is only possible because of the nature of quantum mechanics. So how can we use these facts to design a quantum algorithm? First, what is a quantum algorithm? It's actually just a sequence of such matrices. And what should this sequence do? Well, let's say your algorithm gets some input which we encode as vector v. And let's say that the correct answer for this particular input is the number 4. That means that your quantum algorithm should produce something close to this output. Such a vector would collapse to position 4 with near 100% probability when measured. In other words, when we multiply our sequence of matrices by this input, we should get something close to this output. Each multiplication can be thought of as creating an interference pattern. At the end, we want the resulting wave to be really sharp, with a peak where the true result should be. Of course, this should work not just for one particular input, but for all of them. Okay, but how do we figure out the right sequence of matrices to make this happen? The answer is that in general, we don't know. There are only a small handful of specific problems for which anyone has discovered quantum algorithms that require fewer steps than their classical counterparts. Nobody knows of a way to speed up problems in general, nor is it believed that we will find a general way to do such a thing. I'll put some links in the description if you want to deep dive into some of the particular algorithms that have been found. Anyway, I hope this video clears up some of the common misconceptions out there.